All right, so this is unpublished Seth material on Sound and Great Pyramid. It is the 604th session, January 12th, 1972. Hopefully, if you're listening to this, you've already heard the whole of the Seth material. Otherwise, it might not go in, it might not be assimilated, but that's my disclaimer for you guys here, okay? This is some pretty deep stuff. Alright, so, Seth states, the message for tonight is you are not owned. Now, your human stock did not all originate solely from your planet. I never told you that it did. In that respect, your ancestry is indeed buried. Some of the information given in my own book by inference should have made that clear. Evolution, as it is thought of, had many different aspects in those terms. There were three or four beginning points. There were then visits from others in other planetary systems. In that regard, this is quite natural. Your own relative isolation is far from the average. The legends, many of them therefore, were of course chronicles of quite legitimate physical events, describing phenomena, for example, for which natives had no adequate vocabulary. They were forced to describe what they saw by making comparisons with objects and events already familiar to them. Some such visitors, in your terms, were more evolved than others. All, however, would appear as superhuman in contrast to those civilizations that encountered them. There were some deliberate experiments that were in fact far more dangerous to the experimenters, always in which the experimenters tried, in one way or another, tried to advance man's knowledge. It is not nearly as simple as that, however. There is not a one-line development by the time that feasible inter-system space travel is practical, the psychic abilities are developed to a very high degree. One is necessary for the other. Therefore, it became much more feasible to approach Earthmen during their dream state, when their natural fear reactions were somewhat minimized, and when the danger to the visitors was far less. Out-of-body encounters were used as a matter of course. The visitor could appear and disappear then without fear of pursuit. Civilizations were often warned in advance of natural disasters that were apparent to the visitors with their greater viewpoint. Such warnings were either given in the dream state of the Earthmen for the reasons given, or often in some secluded place, for often the visitors would be attacked. During these eras, in your terms, the speakers often acted as go-betweens. Often warnings of disaster were not followed. Some warnings were misunderstood then as punishment by the gods of, quote, moral misdoing, end quote. The whole moral code idea was originally tailored for the current scene as it is encountered, told in terms that the natives could understand. The pyramids, the huge boulders etched out, all of this was done in one way or another through the use of a knowledge of both coordination points in space and the use of sound. There were instruments that released sound and directed it in the same way, say, that a laser beam does with light. Drawings of some of these exist in primitive Sumerian cave renditions, but the drawings are misinterpreted. The instrument is taken for another. No one knows how to use the instruments. There are a few in existence in your terms. These Sumerians with an A, the Sumari, 
The Sumerians left the memory of their existence in the Sumerian culture, Sumerian with an E. They initiated it, though they did not direct all of its activities, nor were they responsible for the distortions of their teachings that often resulted. There is a difference then between Sumerian, Sumari, and the culture in the books. Your Sumerian were behind the culture. They initiated that particular civilization. I will be clear, your Sumerian showed earth people at that time how to communicate, how to initiate crafts, give them all the fundamentals upon which a civilization then could be based. These Sumerians, your Sumerians, however, were not of human stock at that time. Now, your Sumerians have become human stock in those terms at other times. It is not a point of them trying to invade a native stock. They simply understood the nature of individual existences. Therefore, they are able to choose from various physical systems those in which they would like to have experience. They maintain their inner knowledge and integrity and are born within any given system. They always use their native abilities and talents to help the system, working very strongly in psychic or creative endeavors. I do not necessarily mean that they are consciously aware of their affiliation. This is an individual matter. They are often inventors, always then involved with the initiation of new ideas or discoveries. All of this follows inner patterns that are specifically human in your terms. Humanity, therefore, has its own characteristics, and no, quote, outside influence, end quote, can go counter to these, but must work with them. When it seems that great discoveries come and then are lost through the ages, perhaps to be rediscovered, it simply means that man's own nature was not in harmony with them, could not use them properly. Whenever aggressiveness became too misguided, it automatically caused the loss of powers or discoveries that could be used to destroy the planet. This is a natural aspect, the self-protective principle that operates within Earth life as you know it. On occasion, discoveries were given before their time and promptly lost, only to be rediscovered ages later. The problem comes when you try to categorize consciousness or being. The out-of-body state, in greater terms, is a far more natural state than in the body. You adopt and make a body. You do this now without even knowing that you do so. But a body can be made from the camouflage of any system, constructed easily when you know how to do it. Spacesuits are, therefore, an inadequate, clumsy memory of an inner ability to clothe the inner self with whatever camouflage is at hand, to merge with the elements of an environment in such a way that you become a living part of it. The Sumerians, your Sumerians, did this when they initiated the culture spoken about in your books. Their sense of time is completely different, as, however, your own is innately. It is difficult to explain this, but keeping in touch with a civilization for several thousand years of your Earth time would entail perhaps the same amount of time and effort a man might take in his profession over a period of five to ten years. So the relativity of time is important in that context. So at this point they take a break and at break um, Rob tells Jane that he needed a capsule definition of Sumari and Jane said that last night an ESP class 
Yusuf had commented that the Sumari were a, quote, federation of consciousness, end quote. And also during break, Rob was uh, looking at the massive ruins of Baalbek in a book. And he explained to Jane his feeling that the amazingly intricate stone carving, particularly the bass relief work, seemed beyond the abilities of a hammer and chisel. Jane broke in to tell me that this carving was done by small instruments that used inaudible sound waves. These radiations softened the stone, she said, so the work could be performed. She didn't know where this data came from. If from Seth, it wasn't obvious to her. And 1020, Seth comes back through. He says, basically, in your terms now, there is no such thing as an isolated, independent earth stock, in that consciousness did not suddenly erupt from the physical behavior or characteristics of your planet, or in any other. As you know, consciousness comes first, and then forms the physical materializations of it. Those consciousnesses picked physical materialization chosen to operate under certain conditions that then appear as the natural characteristics of a species to you. They accept certain characteristics and while experiencing existence within them, must follow along the roads they've chosen. Hence, earlier I spoke of the natural bent of humanity of all those then who chose existence within your particular planetary existence. Consciousness is not local, and it never was. You have always been Sumari. This simply means that your consciousness has certain bents of its own, interests and abilities and specializations. The word Sumari characterizes a certain kind of consciousness simply for means of identification in your terms. I told you once that there are clumps of consciousness. This does not mean that consciousness is not individual and separate, but that it also has a great ability to congregate, to reach out in affiliation to share knowledge and experience, and to combine itself in ever-changing patterns while still retaining its basic identity and integrity. To have explained this to you when we began our sessions would not have been possible. Space and time are constructions of ideas. They do not appear physically as, say, a table or a chair, yet they seem to define both a table and a chair in that you cannot easily conceive of a piece of furniture existing except in the medium of space and time. The ideas of space and time are constructed in different ways in various systems. In some, they appear as natural phenomena, for example, as various classifications of objects, in some as variations of sound or light. You find it exceedingly difficult to consider existence at all without space and time. Yet, basically, consciousness is independent of both. The ideas of space and time emerge only when consciousness adopts camouflage only when it becomes wedded, in other words, with a physical type existence. Time and space are both creations of consciousness, in other words, and vehicles of its expression. Matter is a classification. As explained in my book, various levels of concentration can be used as platforms leading you out of focus into other time schemes Time is like color. You are merely focusing upon one hue. Your present civilization and the quote-unquote old Sumerian civilization exist at once then simultaneously. But to speak to you about these, 
I must use a time sequence you understand. If it were understood that these civilizations exist at once, then you would not be so surprised that they, quote unquote, were able to build structures that you cannot build in your now. Your now and their now exist now. In the present physical area in which it seems to you that a physical civilization once existed, that civilization still exists. You cannot meet it though you stand at the same spot because of the ideas of time that separate you. The civilization in flower and the ruins coexist. The living ancient Sumerians pass the modern tourists without seeing them, even as the tourists walk in the middle of the old Sumerian marked places and see only ruins. Much of this could be explained in mathematical equations that presently escape you. Your own consciousness is contemporary with the ancient Sumerians, as well as with your current selves in your terms. Think of countries existing simultaneously now on your planet. There are differences in language and culture, and it takes a certain amount of Earth time to travel through space to visit them. In the same way, all time exists at once with their peculiar customs and, in your terms, within the same space that you know. You have learned how to make roads through space, but not through time on a conscious level. There are intersections in time and space, however, that you have not recognized. I am speaking in your terms, hopefully to make this simpler. Times exist, then, as surely as places. You think of time as moving towards something, and of space as relatively stable. It does not occur to you, then, that you can get to times as you can get to places. All of this is highly difficult to explain. I do not mean, for example, that time, each moment, is a finished and done thing to be visited. While time is not moving in a particular direction in your terms, each moment explodes outwards or expands outwards in all directions. Space and time, as you understand them, ripple through each other. They do not behave as you think they do, however. Presently, you understand your existence only as it intrudes into three dimensions. Its own activity is in many other dimensions, however. These sumari, therefore, appear in or intrude into the three-dimensional system from other dimensions. Okay, so at this time they take another break. And Rob notes, Jane's trance had again been very good. Now she talked more about what she had said at last break, concerning the carving done on stone that had been softened by instruments employing sound. Only a very sophisticated instrument was used, she said, to soften the top layer of the stone so that it was, quote, like frosting, which could then be easily carved the instrument might have done both the softening and the carving. But first of all, she adds, either that instrument or another one was used to isolate the top layer of the stone from the rest of it so that it wasn't weakened. End quote by Jane. So this is all in them discussing the very intricate and extensive bass relief carvings. Uh, pictured on door frames and lintels of the ruins of Baalbek. Uh, and Rob's phonetic interpretation of the word Jane got regarding the instrument in question. He's, he, he spells it like Akasanda. In other words, the Ankh. Okay. Now, 
James says that the sound wasn't audible to human ears. The instrument, quote, sort of looked like, I can't really do it. The shape I'm getting is of a very rough pistol shape. All you had to do was aim it. That was just for the small stuff, end quote, again by Jane. Okay, so Seth comes back in and he states, Now, matter was manipulated through sound. Some remnants of spaceships became temples. Some visitors were seen to die and later again seen recovered. Hence the Egyptians' sureness that the individual survived death. Because of space travel, a visitor might come as a young man and return some 40 Earth years later, still appearing as a young man, leading to the idea of immortality and eternal youth of the gods. The Olympic gods were perhaps the most amusing of man's attempt to deify space travelers. Mixed in here strongly were the ideas of gods mating with earth women. In some respects, the over-enthusiastic use of the sound was responsible for the flood mentioned in the Bible and other literature. It was for this reason that many attempts were made to warn against the impending disaster. The use of sound was important at various times in irrigating dry areas, quite literally by pulling water from a distance. There were several characteristics that proved difficult, however. Literally, the sound traveled often further than was intended, causing consequences not planned upon. Great finesse was important. Sound was also used after irrigation to speed up the flowering of plants and to facilitate transplantation to other areas. It was also utilized for medicinal purposes in operations, particularly in bone and brain operations. Verbal sounds were often stereotyped simply because the effect of sound was understood in its effect upon the body. Many ideas that are considered superstitious had a quite legitimate basis, therefore. Sound was used to locate one also, and to break someone down. It was also used to locate gas pockets. This is a difficult subject, for the movement of heavy tons of rock, for example, different techniques using sound and precise mathematical calculations were necessary. Many civilizations grew and flourished in fertile areas simply because the people knew how to make them fertile and to keep them that way. Alright, so that is where Seth ends that evening. So definitely there is more information here that you guys are going to want to hear if any of that intrigued you. There's just so much here that you can sit and think about and try to put together, especially if, if you guys are going through things like me, which I'm sure many of you are, where it's like in your face everywhere, all these weird, you know, I love documentaries, so documentaries um, about the Sumerians, you know, um, Egypt, uh, even like lizard people, there's all kinds of stuff going on out there and you just wonder what the heck what what is true what is not and um so i have never read this or heard this i just found i actually came upon this online and i will put the link to it but um it is very very interesting putting everything together uh and there's more so definitely uh look for the next video that will give the next part of this unpublished Seth material. Thank you for listening, you guys, and if you have any comments, questions, whatever, definitely leave those for me. I can start a, a thread, a cool thread, maybe. 
And uh, as always, much love to all my listeners and to everyone and everything.